morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of 2023 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent. Under agenda item number one, we are considering two instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. An issue has been raised on one of the instruments, SSI 2023-62, the Act of Sederant, Summary Applications, Statutory Applications and Appeals, etc., Rules 1999 Amendment, Sexual Harm Prevention Orders and Sexual Risk Orders 2023. The instrument provides new court rules for handling applications into the court arising under the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016. The Committee identified an incorrect cross-reference in paragraph 6 of Rule 3.54.4, and that the reference to paragraph 4b should be to paragraph 4c. The Lord President's private office confirmed that the cross-reference is an error and proposes to rectify it at the, at a, in a forthcoming instrument to amend the summary application rules. Does the committee wish to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground in respect of a cross-referencing error in paragraph 6? of Rule 3.54.4, and does the Committee welcome that the Lord President intends to correct the error in a forthcoming amending instrument? Yes. Also under this agenda item, no points have been raised on SSI 2023-72. Under agenda item number two, we are considering the movable transactions at Scotland Bill at stage two. I ask members to refer to their copy of the Bill, the marshalled list of amendments and the groupings of amendments. We are joined today by the Minister for Public Finance, Planning and Community Wealth, Tom Arthur, MSP, and Scottish Government officials. Welcome to you all. Can I remind the Minister's officials that they cannot participate in any Stage 2 proceedings, but they can communicate to the Minister directly. And we have a large number of amendments to consider and dispose of for this Bill. And if the votes are required today, I will call for members to vote yes first, and then call for members to vote no and then for any abstentions. And members should do so by raising their hand, and clerks will collate the vote and pass them to me to read out and confirm the result. And I will take stage two slowly so that we can uh, actually manage the time to and also process uh, the proceedings properly. So with that, uh, I refer first of all to the first of the amendments. So, first of all, it's this in the content of documents. So, I'm going to call Amendments 54 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendments 67 and 74. And Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 54 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and good morning. And can I also say good morning to the Minister and to his team? Uh, perhaps I can just uh, set a slight context uh, for the whole of the amendments that I'm bringing forward. Uh, firstly, to say that clearly we are very supportive of the Bill in principle, and we welcome the comments that, or I welcome the comments that the Scottish Government have made. Uh, the amendments that I am seeking to bring forward uh, this morning are there to, I think, hopefully just clarify some things and to make sure that, in practice, the Bill works. Uh, I'm grateful to those uh, groups who have been in touch with me and who have suggested amendments, and particularly grateful to the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, who um, I've had a number of conversations with um, and who have helped me in regard to uh, the uh, some of the amendments that I'm bringing forward today. So I hope this can be done in a, a constructive way and I look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say in regard to that. If I can then move uh, to Amendment 54, 67 and 74, which are all in uh, my name. Firstly, Amendment number uh, 54. Uh, this amendment would expressly allow the assignation document to refer to the claim by reference to another document or data which is not reproduced in the assignation document itself. The reason I think this is important is that the number of invoice discounting systems use online portal-based invoice discounting systems, and I think we need to ensure that they are able to utilise the register of assignations. Similarly, uh, I'm sure we all want to avoid lengthy documents, including customers' lists, needing to be uploaded to the register. I consider that this approach is coherent with and follows the approach taken for conditions to assignation in section 24 of the bill, and I would ask the committee this morning to accept this amendment. Uh, moving on to amendment number 67, 
The effect of this, if passed, would expressly allow the constructive document in a pledge to refer to the property pledged by reference to another document or data which is not reproduced in the constructive document itself. The reason I'm moving this amendment, convener, is that I think, having spoken to a number of people in practice, they generally consider that a number of pledges will be composite pledges referring to a large number of debtors' assets, and that having to upload such asset lists may be prejudicial to debtors. And so, again, I hope this is a, a constructive amendment which the committee can support this morning. Finally, in this section, um, in regard to amendment number 74, uh, this would um, have an effect in section 56, page 32, line 23 of the bill. The effect of this amendment expressly allows for an amendment document in respect of a pledge to refer to a property pledged by reference to another document or data which is not reproduced in the constructive document itself. Again, having spoken to those in practice, I consider that a number of pledges will be composite pledges referring to a large number of debtors' assets, and that having to upload such asset lists may be prejudicial to debtors. This could also apply in respect to the amendment of the pledge. And again, I think this will make things clearer for those who are dealing with this day in, day out. And I look forward to hearing the Minister's response to these, but I will move these three amendments. OK, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Do any other members want to come in or offer any comments? OK, thank you. Minister. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the committee. Amendments 54, 67 and 74, all in the name of Mr Balfour, take forward a suggestion by the Law Society of Scotland that it would be helpful to replicate a provision made at Section 24 of the Bill in respect of the assignation of a claim which is subject to a condition. That provision which enables a condition to be specified by reference to another document. The amendments would add this provision in respect of assignation documents, constitutive documents for pledges and documents which amend pledges. We do not think that these amendments are strictly necessary. In Section 2, the Bill talks about the requirement to specify information. In contrast, the sections now being amended just talk about a requirement to identify something. That much more readily admits to the idea of doing so by reference to an external document. However, if stakeholders consider that this clarification would be helpful, we have no objections to making the necessary changes. There are, though, in some issue, there are, though some issues with the precise detail of the amendments. In particular, Amendment 54 is technically defective. When read with Section 1 2 of the Bill, it provides that an assignation document must identify the claim, including by making reference to another document. This could be read as meaning that the assignation document must include reference to another document, which is not the intention. There are other technical difficulties with the amendments, too. We refer not just to documents, but also to data. This is unnecessary due to the definition of a document in the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. Including it here, but not in Section 2.4, would also cause potential difficulties. I am therefore happy to commit to working with Mr Balfour to bring forward suitable amendments at Stage 3 if he decides not to press his amendments today. Alternatively, if he does wish to press them, I am happy to support them on the understanding that they will need to be adjusted at Stage 3. Okay, thank you, Minister. Jeremy. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his um, uh, helpful remarks and for his um, helpful explanation? Um, I think it would be helpful, if it's OK with the Minister, to have these three down at the moment, and I would be welcome any working with him to then get them absolutely right for stage three, but I think to have them at, ready for that would be helpful. So it would be my intention, Convener, to move uh, uh, Amendment Number 54 in my name. OK, uh, thank you. So, uh, with that, the, the question is that Amendment 54 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Move to the financial collateral arrangements and financial instruments. I call amendments, sorry, Amendment 55 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I draw members' attention to the procedural information relating to this group as set out in the groupings. I point out that if Amendment 55 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 56 due to a pre-emption. So with that, Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 55 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you again, Convener. Um, 
can I first of all move Amendment 55 in my name? Um, this amendment deletes part of Section 15 by ensuring that Part 1 of a bill operates without prejudice to the rules relating to financial collateral arrangement. The reason for this is that Section 1 deals with assignation or transfer of claims. As the explanatory notes state in paragraph 11, and I quote, subsection, subsection 5 provides that nothing in Part 1 applies to the assignation of a claim as part of a financial collateral arrangement within the meaning of the financial collateral arrangements number 2, regulations 2003, end quote. Financial collateral arrangements are defined as a, a title transfer financial collateral arrangement or a security financial collateral arrangement, whether or not these are covered by a master agreement or a general terms of conditions. Financial collateral arrangements are a form of security arrangement designed to simplify the process of obtaining financial collateral. Financial collateral is also referred to and defined as either cash or financial arrangements. Again, having spoken to the Law Society and others in practice, um, I believe that the current terms of Section 1, Subsection 5, referring to a proposition that nothing in Part 1 applies to the assignation of a claim as part of a financial collateral arrangement, lacks clarity. Instead, we consider that the provisions of Part 1 should be without prejudice to the rules for financial collateral arrangements. If I can now move on to speak to in to uh, Amendment 56 and the other amendments in this section. Um, as the Minister will be aware and the Committee will be aware, out with the issue of individuals being included in this bill, this is perhaps the most uh, interesting, controversial bit of the legislation, in that it uh, does not include uh, the provisions around stocks and shields, which was in the provisional draft bill by the Law Commission. Um, we have debated this um, as a committee, and I know the Minister has made uh, the Scottish Government views very clear. I should say it's not my intention, Convener, to move any of these amendments. They are very much probing amendments. Um, and I suppose the two things I'm still looking for clarity from Scottish Government on is why you think it's not possible to do this in regard to this particular bill. Um, Obviously, the Law Commission, when they drafted the original bill, thought it was legally competent. Um, others have given um, legal advice to say that it is competent as well. And I know that the Minister has said, when he gave evidence to the committee previously, that his legal advice was that it wasn't competent to have it within this bill. And I wonder whether he could just maybe expand on that slightly, because clearly... In practical terms, this is perhaps one of the most important parts of the bill, that this will allow much greater freedom for business um, to take place, which is all what we want to see. So if it could be included in this bill, it would seem to me sensible. And so I, I'm just looking to see a bit more around that legal advice. The second thing, if the government is of the view that it can't be included because of... Um, whatever reason they give in a moment. Can I just push the Minister again? I, I appreciate in his letter to us, he said that once the bill is passed and becomes an act, then there can be more engagement with the UK government on this. Um, I suppose what I'm hearing from boards again in practice is how long will this take? And I appreciate it's two governments having to work together, but I wonder if we could give some kind of time scale as to when we would see... Um, this actually happening in practice. Um, and I will leave it there at the moment, if it's OK with you, Convener. OK, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Any other members have any comments? OK, thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, the, the committee is aware that when considering the draft bill, which was attached to the Scottish Law Commission's report on movable transactions, the Scottish Government arrived at the view that the provisions which related to financial collateral arrangements and financial instruments were not within the alleged competence of the Scottish Parliament. And for that reason, the bill as introduced did not include these provisions. Instead, we've always made it clear uh, our intention is to seek a Section 104 order 
under the Scotland Act 1998 to effectively make the necessary provision. We recognise stakeholders' view that it is important that the provisions in the Bill apply to financial collateral and financial instruments, and we do share that view. And I know um, that you, convener, wrote recently to the Scotland Office in connection with progress in the Section 104 order, and have had the benefit of seeing that response. And I hope that the committee will be assured that good progress is being made. And as I have offered before, I will continue to keep the committee updated on further progress. And I would like to reiter reiterate that any eventual Section 104 order will be capable of being made only once the bill has passed. So with regards to timescales, it will be dictated by the parliamentary timetable. Our target for commencing this legislation is, of course, assuming that it is passed by the Scottish Parliament, has always been the spring-summer of the next year, as that is when the registers and regulations should be in place. So this should give us ample time to get the necessary agreements on the Section 104 order, so that these provisions, which are not within the Bill as introduced through the 104 order, will be able to commence at the same time as the registers commence. Now, the bulk of amendments in this group are, in our view, out with the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament, so I am unable to support them as they would put the passing of this bill at risk. So I would therefore ask the member not to press them, and I appreciate the remarks he made with regards to them being probing amendments. While most of the amendments in this group simply seek to reinsert the provisions which we removed prior to introduction because we considered them to be out with competence, there are two amendments which are slightly different, albeit raising legislative competence, competency concerns of their own. Amendment 56 attempts to change the position which would apply pending the passing of the Section 104 order. I am aware that this was initially suggested by a number of academics as well as the Law Society of Scotland. However, we have engaged with the academics and practitioners on the SLC's working group on this point, and they are now content that matters should be left as they are pending the passing of a Section 104 order. The Scottish Government believes that any attempt to say that the two regimes can coexist without making bespoke provision to reconciling any conflicting rules would be unclear, unhelpful and raise legislative competency issues. Amendment 84 imposes a reporting duty in relation to progress on the Section 104 order. I think it is clear to members, I certainly hope so from my correspondence with the committee today, that there is no need for such a duty because I am fully committed to keeping the committee up to date on progress. Those updates will be provided as and when progress is made, rather than be tied to an arbitrary date which may not be appropriate. So, For these reasons, I would ask a member not to press any of the amendments. Um, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Can I just seek, in regard to Amendment 55, whether you believe that is incompetent? Because my, um, I think Section 50, uh, Amendment 55, I, I, are you thinking that is also without, without, it is incompetent in regard to the legislation? Because I think that is simply seeking to amend something within the present legislation. I would leak clarification on that issue, if possible, Minister. What I would say is that given the, the progress that we're making with the Section 104, which will ultimately be to ensure that the Bill achieves the effects that the SLC intended for it to achieve, um, and given that we're looking for those provisions to come into effect at the time when the registers go live, I would say that the, pro uh, the approach that we have set out in the legislation um, is sufficient to meet the objectives of the SLC uh, objectives in um, through the bill as they proposed. So I would just I, I recognise there's a key keen interest to ensure that these provisions do come online and that I can understand a, a desire to look for any compromise options. But given that this these registers will commence um, we hope um, next summer, subject to Parliament agreeing at stage three, given that we are making progress on the section one oh four order, I would ask on that basis that the member doesn't press the amendments. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And so, uh, Chair Balfour to uh, wind up and also to press or withdraw Amendment 55. Uh, thank you, Mina. Uh, again, can I thank the Minister for his helpful uh, remarks. I I'm pleased that um, that timescale is still hopefully achievable by next summer. Um, I, I will go and reflect on what he has said um, today in before Stage 3, uh, but I will not be moving Section 55. OK, thank you. So, uh, Chairman Balfour will, uh, will be uh, withdrawing Amendment uh, 55. Uh, if uh, a member, let's see, does any member, uh, does uh, any member object to that? No. Okay. 
Thank you. So Amendment 55 is withdrawn. And I also remind, remind, so remind members that if Amendment 55 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 56. OK. So if... Uh, <coughs> yeah, so... Pardon? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, call Amendment 56 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Uh, not moved. Already, okay, already debated with Amendment 55. Not moved. Okay. So, does any member, um, does all members agree to that or, or object? Okay. So, Amendment 56 is <coughs> withdrawn. So, <coughs> so, it's not moved. Uh, so, the question is that Section 1 uh, be agreed to, are we all agreed? And the question is that Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. OK. So we move to the designations, technical amendments, and call Amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister, to move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. I, I move Amendment 1, which is a technical amendment which relates to the possibility that they are competing assignation documents in relation to the same claim. In most cases, the claim will transfer to whichever assignee first benefited from intimation or registration of the assignation document, because that will usually be the final requirement to be met under Section 3.2, and so will give rise to the transfer. However, in some cases, it might not be the final requirement to be satisfied. This amendment deals with a scenario where the final requirement to be met is a claim becoming identifiable. This might happen if it is a future claim. Amendment 1 provides that if the final requirement for transfer is all met when the claim becomes identifiable as one that is covered by the assignation, the claim transfers to the person who first benefited from registration or intimation in their favour. While it should be very unusual for the same claim to be assigned by one person to different people, this ensures clarity by breaking what would otherwise have been a tie. It also ensures that Section 3.5c deals and deals consistently with all of the possible ways in which a tie could arise. Amendments 2 and 3 are technical amendments which relate to the possibility that a claim may be assigned in whole or in part. Although assignation in part is likely to be rare, it is still important that suitable provision is made for it. The effect of Amendment 2 is twofold. First, it provides that it is whether it is likely that assignation will make the obligation more burdensome on the debtor that matters. The question of whether the claim can be assigned in part will therefore be assessed when the assignation is made, rather than it potentially appearing to be valid at the time, but becoming challengeable when unforeseen events occur later. Second, at the moment, Section 5 provides that the requirement for a claim to be uh, divisible in order to be partially assigned applies only where the debtor does not consent to partial assignation. However, a claim that is not divisible cannot be assigned in part. The amendment therefore makes it clear that the requirement for divisibility applies whether or not the debtor consents. Amendment 3 provides that an agreement about any expense which is attributable, the claim being assigned in part, rather than as a whole, may be made with the assigner or with the person who was a holder of the claim at the time of agreeing it. This simply recognises that an agreement with a previous holder is valid and matters do not have to be renegotiated every time the holder changes. In relation to Amendment 9, it has been suggested that it should be competent to register an assignation document which assigns different claims to different people. The intention would be to restrict the associated application for registration to only the claims that are relevant to the particular assignee in question. Amendment 9 therefore provides for this. Amendment 12 removes Section 38, which disapplies the Transmission of Movable Property Scotland Act 1862 in relation to assignations to which Part 1 applies from the Bill. It replaces it with a section repealing the 1862 Act in its entirety. This is because even if assignations of financial collateral arrangements were not brought into the Bill by a Section 104 order, as we expect them to be, we have now satisfied ourselves, following discussions with the SLC's advisory group, that there is no purpose for which we would want to preserve the 1862 Act. 
In relation to Mr Balfour's Amendment 61, I understand that the Law Society of Scotland believes that the question of how long a notice should take to be deemed to have arrived ought to be subject to a determination as to method of service under Section 86. Our understanding is that this amendment is intended to achieve that. However, unfortunately, it does not work and is unnecessary. If someone tries to intimate using a method of service that is not allowed under a, a determination entered into by the parties, that will not be a valid intimation as a result of Section 86A. As such, it is irrelevant when the notice is taken to arrive under Section 89 because it will not achieve anything. If someone tries to intimate by post in a case when a particular postal address has been agreed between the parties under the determination, intimation to a different address will be invalid as a result of Section Section 85B. Again, it will therefore be irrelevant when the notice to the wrong address is taken to arrive because it will not achieve anything. And if someone intimates by post to the address that has been agreed between the parties under the determination, the rule about when it is deemed to arrive under Section 89 already applies. Indeed, Section 89A includes an express reference to the fact that the relevant address may have been modified by the parties under subsection 6B. Amendment 61 is therefore unnecessary and will simply confuse matters. And I would ask Mr Balfour not to move it. Mr Balfour's Amendment 65 was also suggested by the Law Society and would mean that those acting in the place of assignees, such as trustees and agents, would be included in the definition of assignees. The Government does not believe that this is necessary. Legislation does not normally deal expressly with trustees and agents, since the general law deals with this suitably, and it would be cumbersome to always have to mention every possible representative capacity in which a person could act. However, in this case, we actually already have a provision at section 116.2, which explicitly provides that someone who is required to do a thing can have someone else do it for them. I would therefore ask Mr Balfour not to press the amendment on the basis that it is unnecessary. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, Jeremy Balfour uh, to speak to Amendment 61 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you. And uh, if I can move firstly to Amendment 61. Um, as the uh, Minister has outlined, this amendment ensures that the ta time scale for valid intimation will also be subject to a determination as to the method of service. Um, as he says, I think there has been some concerns about the wording in this bill um, as introduced, that some of the detail in respect of intimation is slightly too prescriptive, uh, and more aspects of intimation, including how long after serving a notice should receipt of such notice be deemed, should also be subject to determination as to the method of the service. Uh, however, in the light of what the Minister has said, it would be my intention uh, to uh, reflect on his words um, and not move this today. However, I'm, I, I am still um, inclined to move section, Amendment 65, um, because this amendment changes the definition of a signee by including trustee or agents of the signee. Now, I accept what the Minister has said, that there is provision for this um, later in the Bill. But it is still uh, my view that to have this in would be helpful uh, going forward and, again, would give clarity going forward. Um, I think the view simply in defining assignee, the person to whom a claim is assigned, does still lack clarity. Trustees and agents of assignees can act on the assignee's behalf. And it is possible for creditors to hold claims pledges as trustees and or agents for themselves and other creditors. This amendment simply makes clear that those acting in the place of an assignees are included in the definition of assignees. And for that, I think clarity is always a good thing, um, and I think it will just uh, put on to the face of the bill um, something that people will be able to understand and refer to. In regard to the amendments moved by the Minister, um, I will be supporting all of those. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jeremy, do any other members have any comments? No, okay. So, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I will just respond um, briefly to Mr Balfour's remarks on Amendment 65 to reiterate the point that I made in my earlier remarks that I do not deem it to be necessary. And indeed, I would reiterate, as I previously stated, 
with uh, regards to the provisions of section 116 of the Bill, Interpretation of the Act, specifically 116 subsection 2, which states, for the record, where, under or by virtue of a provision of this Act, however expressed, a person P is required or permitted to proceed in some way, the provision is to be construct, construed as if any reference in it to P includes a reference to any person authorised by P to proceed in such a way on P's behalf. So I hope that can provide um, assurance to Mr Balfour and the committee that the provisions within Amendment 65 are not required. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <clears throat> the question is that section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And call amendment 57 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Okay. The question is that amendment 57 mm -hmm. be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Oh, sorry. Sorry, not moved. Sorry. sorry. So I call amend amendment 58 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 58. I'll speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Camilla. Um, you're going to be bored of my voice by the end of uh, this morning. Um, and uh, all these um, amendments um, deal with the whole subject of insolvency. And if I can just briefly take you through each one. Uh, amendment 58. This amendment replaces an existing ground on which an individual will be considered to be insolvent. The reason for this is that Section 4 of the Bill provides for the legal effect of an assignation document in the event of the assigner's insolvency. Section 4, subsection 6 provides for circumstances where an assigner who is an individual or the estate of which may be sequestered by the virtue of Section 6 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 becomes insolvent. Those circumstances are set out in section uh, 4, subsection 6, 1, 2, 6. As initially drafted, they included the assigner of grant and a trust deed for creditors or makes a composition or arrangement with creditors. Again, having spoken to those in practice, uh, they consider and I consider that these are too vague. A trust deed could only include a privately agreed trust arrangement and in particular specified statutory protected trustees. I consider that only the latter should apply. In respect of the compositions and arrangements with creditors, um, I note that composition was a specific technical term until 2014, when its technical use was repealed. I also note that the arrangement is a technical term in English law, but not in Scottish law. I therefore consider that references to compositions and arrangements should be removed. This amendment clarifies that where the accountant in bankruptcy registers such a protected trust deed, that it is a basis for recognition of his signer's insolvency and removes reference to compositions, a historical technical term in Scotland with no continuing importance, and arrangements, a technical term in England, but not in Scots law. In regard to amendment number 59, this amendment ensures that a company voluntary arrangement, a CVA, only constitutes the insolvency of an assigneur for the purpose of the assignation provisions in the bill, if it affects the relevant claim in question. Again, well, this will prevent irrelevant CVAs from affecting assignations and reflects the position adopted in respect of administration receivers set out in section 4, subsection 6b3. Section uh, amendment number 60. Again, this amendment ensures that a restructuring plan which affects an assigned claim under part 26a of the Companies Act 2006 constitutes the insolvency of an assigneur. Part 26a of the Companies Act 2006 deals with arrangements and reconstructions of companies in financial difficulty. Section 91A sets out the provisions of Part 26A to apply to a company. This section applies where a company is encountering financial difficulties that may affect the company's ability to carry on business as an ongoing concern and that a compromise or arrangement is proposed between the company, its creditors or shareholders with a view to eliminate, reduce, prevent or mitigate the financial difficulties which the company is experiencing. 
In other contexts, for example, Section 233B of the Insolvency Act 1986, Part 26A arrangements are recognised as being relevant insolvency procedures. The Bill makes no reference to such arrangements under the Companies Act 2006, and I consider that it should do so to ensure consistency with the wider insolvency law. In line with the approach taken in respect of administrative receiverships, this should only apply to the extent that it affects the claim. If I can move now to uh, amendment number 70, which is still within this grouping. This amendment again ensures that a reconstruction plan under Part 26A of the Companies Act 2006, which affects the incumbent property, constitutes the insolvency of a provider. Part 26A of the Companies Act 2006 deals with arrangements and reconstructions of companies in financial difficulty. Section 91A sets out the provisions for Part 26A to apply to a company. This section applies where a company is encountering financial difficulties that may affect the company's ability to carry on business as an ongoing concern and that a compromise or arrangement is proposed between the company and its creditors or shareholders with a view to eliminate, reduce, prevent or mitigate the financial difficulties which the company is experiencing. In other contexts, for example, in Section 233B of the Insolvency Act 1986, Part 26A arrangements are recognised as being relevant insolvency procedures. The Bill again makes no reference to such arrangements under the Companies Act 2006, and I consider that it should do so to ensure consistency with wider insolvency law. In line with this approach taken in respect of administrative receiverships, this should only apply to the extent that it affects the incumbent's property. If I can now move to section 71, again, this amendment provides and replaces an existing ground on which a provider who is an individual will be considered to be insolvent. Section 47 of the bill provides for the legal effect of the creation of a pledge in the event of a provider's insolvency. Section 47.3 provides the circumstances where, and I quote, provider who is an individual or the estate of which may be segregated by virtue of Section 6 of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 2016 becomes insolvent. Close quote. These circumstances are set out in Section 47, subsection 3, 1 to 6, as initially drafted, they included the provider granting a trust deed for creditors or makes a composition or arrangement with creditors. Um, having again spoken to those within the profession, it is my view that we should consider that these are too vague. A trust deed could only include a privately agreed trust arrangement and also a particular specified statutory protected trust deed. We consider that, I consider, and we lost sight to consider, that the latter should apply. In respect of the compositions and arrangements with creditors, I note that the composition was a specific technical term until 2014, and when its technical use was repealed. As I've said previously, it is a technical term used within English law, but not, as I understand, within Scots law. I therefore consider that reference to compositions and arrangements should be removed for clarification. And this amendment would then clarify where the accountant in bankruptcy registers such a protected trust deed is the basis for recognition of a provider's insolvency and removes references again to compositions, um, a historical term, and arrangements which are, no long, which are a technical term in England, but not in Scotland. Finally, uh, you'll be glad to hear, Convener, in regard to these particular amendments, um, I move to Amendment 72. Again, this again, amendment ensures that a company voluntary arrangements, CVA, only constitute the insolvency of a provider for the purpose of a pledge provision in the bill if it affects the relevant incumbent property in question. This prevents irrelevant CVAs from affecting statutory pledges and reflects the position adopted in respect of administrative receivers set out in section 47.3b.3. I, I appreciate that these are all fairly technical amendments, um, which no doubt lawyers will have years of discussion 
coming forth if accepted. But actually, it is very important to have, I think, these amendments down, because we do need clarification in regard to insolvency and how this bill relates to other acts already in place. And for that reason, I hope the committee will accept them this morning. OK, uh, thank you, Jeremy. So just uh, for confirmation, are you moving Amendment 58? I am committed. OK, thank you. So um, any other colleagues? Any questions, any points? OK, thank you. And Minister. Convener, I note these amendments form part of the Law Society of Scotland's response to the committee's call for written evidence at stage one. And I understand that the Law Society consider amendments 58 and 70 necessary because they think that the existing references are too vague and consider that only a statutory protected trust deed should be in scope. We tend to think that the wording as introduced in the bill is amply flexible to cover a number of situations, whereas to remove and replace with what these amendments propose is to only allow for when a protected trust deed is registered by the accountant in bankruptcy, at which point it becomes protected. It is therefore, in our view, too restrictive. The more flexible wording as drafted would include the granting of a voluntary trust deed as well as a protected trust deed. The Law Society consider amendments 59 and 72 are necessary to ensure that what they consider irrelevant company voluntary arrangements are prevented from affecting assignations and statutory pledges. Our view is that this is not necessary. The relevant subsections are for ascertaining if an assignor or provider is insolvent. Whether any voluntary arrangements include this claim or property is unimportant to that consideration. Finally, Amendments 60 and 71 are considered necessary by the Law Society on the basis that the Bill makes no reference to such arrangements under the Companies Act 2006, and they consider that it, would, that it should do so to ensure consistency with wider insolvency law. These amendments seek to add a further catch to the corporate insolvency net. Part 26A of the Companies Act 2006 enables companies to apply to the court for an order sanctioning arrangement or reconstruction agreed with a majority of members or creditors should they find themselves in financial difficulty. Section 901F of the Companies Act 2006 refers to the process of the court sanctioning any such agreement. We have considered this issue previously, and the view taken was that provisions under Part 26A mainly refer to companies in difficulty as opposed to those that are insolvent. And we tend to think that this amendment has no utility in expanding the corporate insolvency provisions in the bill as introduced. The Scottish Law Commission recognised that the law on insolvency as it related to assignations and pledges was complex. It was partly for that reason that they included the power to adjust the definition of insolvency if necessary. While we should not defer this matter to regulations if we are convinced that a change is appropriate now, we are not convinced that it has been shown that this is indeed the case. I am concerned that the group of changes that are being proposed may not be sufficiently cohesive. For example, the suggestion seems to be that voluntary trust deeds should not be included, but that voluntary restructuring plans should be. In addition, the amendments do not seem to have been as fully considered as they need to be, given that Amendment 71 erroneously changes the definition of when an individual is insolvent when the item in question is about being subject to a company restructuring plan. My preference would therefore be that we do not rush into any changes just now, and instead we take the time that is needed to consult with relevant academics and the accountant in bankruptcy, safe in the knowledge that we will be able to adjust this at a later stage if it is agreed that any changes are appropriate. For these reasons, I would ask the member not to press these amendments. Okay, thank you, Minister. So, Jeremy Balfour to wind up and to press or withdraw the amendment. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, it's over just 30 years ago that I uh, sweated blood and tears um, when I was trying to do uh, company law, um, and I was pleased to say that I never practised it in, in my life. Um, however, I have really re looked at these amendments, and I have had conversations, and I do actually slightly disagree um, at this time with the, the Minister's uh, position. Um, my own view is, is that we do need some more clarity around this whole area of insolvency. It is, as the Law Commission and as the Minister said this morning, very technical. 
but if we can bring any more clarity to a very technical area, then I am of the view that these should be on the face of the bill and that we should become an act. If they do not achieve what I think they achieve, as the Minister has said, there is room to bring forward, um, in later stage, um, a change to that. But I think this actually does clarify the situation, and so it would be my intention, uh, Convener, to move uh, Amendment 58 in my name. OK. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeremy. So, with that, the question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? OK, so there will be a division. Uh, so, with that, uh, can I, for all those who agree with uh, sec uh, Amendment 58, uh, please raise your hands. Yeah. And all those who are against, please raise your hands. OK, thank you. So, the result of the division is three for and two against. So, the amendment is agreed. So I call Amendment 59 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Uh, already debated with Amendment 58. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Commissioner. Okay, th thank you. So the question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, there will be a division. So all those uh, who agree with uh, Amendment 59, please raise your hands. All those who uh, are against? So the result is uh, three, four, and two against. So Amendment 59 is agreed to. I call Amendment um, 60 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 58. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. OK, thank you. So uh, all those uh, who agree with uh, Amendment 60, please raise your hands. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So the question is that Amendment uh, 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, OK. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, all those who agree, uh, please raise your hands. All those uh, who are against. So, uh, the vote is 3-4 and 2 against for Amendment 60. So, yeah, so it's agreed. So the question is that section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? So I call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 1. The Minister to move or not to move? Moved. OK. <coughs> uh, so the question... No, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. So that's a, Amendment 2 is agreed. Call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 1. The Minister move or not move? Moved. Yeah. And the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, so Amendment 3 is agreed. Uh, the question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 6 and 7 be agreed. Uh, are we all agreed? I call Amendment 61, in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 1. Jeremy Balfour to move or not to move? Uh, not move, Commissioner. OK, thank you. So the question is that Section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. So uh, move on to assignations, the debtor protections. Uh, call Amendment 62 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendments 63, 4 and 8. So Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 62 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you. If I can move uh, initially Amendment 62 in my name. Um, this amendment deletes Section 10, 3b and c of the Bill. Section 10, sorry, Section 10, Subsection 1 states that a debtor will satisfy the debt if a debtor in good faith paid the last person who they knew held the debt. And Section 10, Subsection 3 includes provisions that a debtor will not be considered to have performed other than in good faith just because the debtor is deemed to have received notice of assignation of the debt. 
I consider that if the assignee can demonstrate that the processes for intimation have been completed with, then the onus should be on the debtor to demonstrate that they were in good faith. In regard to um, amendment number 63, the bill states that the debtor will satisfy the debt if they, in good faith, pay the last person who they knew held the debt. The bill currently states that the debtor will not be considered, so will be considered not to be in good faith just because they have received an intimation of an assignation of the debt. This amendment removes that provision and should be read in conjunction with the previous amendment. The reason for this is that I consider that if the assignee can again demonstrate that the processes for intimation have been complied with, then the owner should be on the debtor to demonstrate that they were in good faith. Um, I look forward to hearing um, the Minister's reaction to these two uh, amendments, and I look forward to hearing uh, the explanation for the amendments 4 and 8 in his name. Thank you, Commissioner. OK, thank you, Jeremy. So I invite the Minister to speak to Amendment 4 and other amendments in the group. Convener, amendments 62 and 63 in the name of Jeremy Balfour were, I know, included in the Law Society of Scotland's written evidence to the committee at stage one of the bill. I understand that the Law Society's view is that if the assignee can demonstrate that the processes for intimation have been complied with, then the onus should be on the debtor to demonstrate that they were in good faith. These amendments remove a protection for a debtor who would have been able to rely on the provisions in section 10. Under the current law, a claim would only transfer if the assignation was intimated to the debtor. However, the effect of the changes in the bill is to extend the scope of intimation and to enable registration as a method of effecting transfer of a claim. As such, the debtor may not know that a claim has been assigned and may in good faith pay an assigner who is no, no longer the creditor. The onus is placed on the person making the assertion that a debtor has performed other than in good faith. Whether or not a debtor has performed in good faith will depend on the facts of the case. My view is that these amendments do not take into account the extension to the scope of intimation and that in reversing the burden of proof they would be unfair to the debtor. How could a debtor prove a negative? This is effectively what they would be required to do if they have not in fact received notification, even though they may be deemed to have done so. The person intimating the assignation could choose to do so in a way that allows for delivery to be recorded. So they could choose to do so in a way that would give evidence of delivery, whereas the debtor has no control over that. For that reason, I would ask that the member withdraws or does not move these amendments. The new section provided by Amendment 4 would provide a debtor performing in good faith with further protection, both where the debtor is unaware of a condition pertaining to the assignation of a claim, or where the debtor is aware of the condition but mistakenly thinks that it has been met and performs to the assignee. The claim will not have transferred because the condition has not been satisfied, but in the circumstances I have described, which mean that the debtor performs to the assignee, the debtor will be discharged from the claim to the extent of that performance because they have acted in good faith. Section 14 applies where notice of an assignation document has been given to a debtor by the assignee rather than the assignor. It has the effect that the debtor may request from the assignee reasonable evidence of the assignation document having been granted. Where an assignation document has been granted, the debtor will be entitled to withhold performance from each of the assigner and the assignee until the evidence is provided by the assignee. When an assignation document has not been granted, the debtor will be entitled to withhold performance until either the purported assignee or the purported assignee confirms in writing that an assignation document has not been granted in respect of the claim. Section 14 also allows a debtor who has not received intimation of an assignation but becomes aware that an assignation document may have been granted to ask the purported assigner to confirm whether that is the case and to withhold performance until they receive that confirmation. Amendment 8 makes it clear that if a debtor is a co-debtor and only one co-debtor makes a request for information, the protection of section 14 to withhold information until the evidence is provided is available only to the co-debtor who made the request and not other co-debtors. The other co-debtors are likely to be unaware of the request for information and it follows that their obligation should not also be suspended. 
Okay, thank you. <coughs> so, any, first of all, uh, any other colleagues want to come in? No, okay. So, Jeremy Balfour to uh, wind up and uh, press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. In regard to the two amendments moved by the Government 4 and 8, um, I do support those. Um, I think it is um, a balancing act between getting the uh, rights uh, for a debtor and a creditor right. Um, but I do accept what the Minister has said this morning, um, and I would like to go away and reflect further um, on what his comments have made. And for that reason, um, I seek your permission to withdraw uh, Amendment 62. OK, uh, thank you. So, uh, Sir Jeremy Balfour seeks to withdraw Amendment 62. Does any member object? OK, thank you. So, yeah, yeah, so Amendment uh, 62 has been withdrawn. So, I call Amendment 63 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 62. Jeremy Balfour to I would seek to withdraw that one as well. Not moved. OK, not moved. OK. <clears throat> so, the question is that Section 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, the questions of sections 11 and 12 be agreed to or well agreed. Do I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister? Already debated with Amendment 62. Uh, Minister to move or not move? Moved. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. So we move to the assignations, uh, a certain defence uh, or right of compensation. So I call Amendment 47 in the name of uh, Carol Mochen, uh, grouped with amendments uh, as shown in the groupings. So Carol Mochen to move Amendment 47 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. Uh, can I start by saying that we, um, I, you know, as I've spoke to the Minister, I'm very broadly supportive of the, the bill and I really thank the Minister and the team for the discussions that we've had. I know that the, the direction we want to go in is to get this bill right for people, so it's much appreciated. Um, and as I go through, I hope um, it's shown that I have listened to the discussions with the Minister and to the sector, particularly around consumer protection. So I move Amendment 47 and speak to my other amendments in this group. In moving Amendment 47, I seek to make it clear that the possibility of waiving, waiving of defence being removed based on agreement between assigner and debtor is removed. Amendment 48 is simply consequential of Amendment 47, as there would be no agreement to prevent or restrict. I am grateful, as I said to the Minister, for considering such amendments and if he can set out clearly how the government can provide assurances to small businesses and others that wave of defence is protected, I would not be inclined to press these amendments. Convener, in bringing forward Amendment 49, I have similar intentions to that in Amendment 47, and it is my hope that we will provide the maximum level of support to sole traders and to individual consumers. And therefore, again, I look to the Minister and his remarks to highlight how he will ensure the Bill will offer, that protections, um, offer the protections that this amendment would otherwise provide. The aforementioned points, Convener, remains applicable to my moving of Amendment 50 also. As for Amendment 51, um, I discussed this with the Minister, Convener, I do consider it appropriate that, uh, that there are adequate and sound reporting mechanisms in place to ensure the impact of the Waiver of Defence Clause is given consideration, indeed that steps are in place to ensure MSPs can question government over the impact of this clause should any negative impacts be identified and require mitigation. It may be worthwhile for the Minister to confirm whether he is content that Parliament can request a review at any time and indeed that he can say with a strong degree of certainty that such calls for a review would be accepted if challenges were to arise. It is my view that having reporting expectations set out within the legislation removes those challenges we may face further down the line if ministers find themselves unwilling to review legislation that is, ha uh, has have it, that is having unintended negative consequences. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you. And I'm just going to invite the minister to speak to Amendment 5 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Carol Mawkins' amendments would remove the ability of debtors and assigners to agree to waive defences, which, in relation to a claim the debtor might have against the assignee, 
Had amendments seek to remove this right as a whole, but also alternatively to remove specifically the right of individuals who are not acting in the course of a business and sole trained traders to make such an agreement. I know that the committee said in its stage one report that it had considered whether the option to waive defence clauses should be removed for all, but it was mindful of the potential impact of this on business freedom and on small businesses who may wish to retain this possibility. I recognise that Ms Mock asked for reassurance, so I would like to state on the record that I had met with Colin Borland, the policy lead for the Federation of Small Businesses in Scotland, and asked if they had any concerns about waiver of defence clauses. The FSB indicated that this was not a subject in which they received any representations from their members, and it was not one in which they held strong views. The Scottish Government has also not received any representations from members of the public about the practice of waiver of defence clauses. It would therefore seem that this is not an issue of concern to stakeholders, and it would be unfortunate if business freedom to make such agreements were to be removed in the absence of any harm being identified. Amendment 51 would place a duty on Scottish ministers to prepare and publish a report setting out the impact of the waiver of defence clause in section 13.1. We will want to continue dialogue with, uh, with organisations such as the Federation of Small Businesses to gauge how this legislation is helping them or possibly hindering them, and we will learn from that engagement. A formal review after a prescribed period of time seems unnecessary, given the lack of any indication of current problems. It would be dictating now the use of future resources when there may never be any issue with this provision, and attention may be better used elsewhere. Uh, certainly. I, I mean, I appreciate what the Minister is saying, but if everything is fine, the review can be you know, a, a very quick process. But... I think we, you know, around this area, there is concern that we don't know how this will work in practice. And I would have thought to have that kind of more formal opportunity to carry out a review would give stakeholders that opportunity to do it. Because if they don't, how do stakeholders then go about having that input into how it's actually working in practice? I recognise at the point that uh, Mr Balfour is making, and indeed what the original intention is behind Ms Mawkins' amendment, the government has regular dialogue with a range of business representative organisations, and indeed there is regular dialogue and engagement at ministerial level as well. So should any issues arise, there would be an opportunity in the first instance for that direct communication to government, where government could consider, as a consequence of that direct engagement, whether or not any review or further action was required. But beyond that, of course, Parliament has a very important role to play. All ministers are accountable to Parliament. All ministers are subject to questions by other parliamentarians and indeed by committees. So I think there are avenues available whereby should concerns arise, either through direct engagement with the government from representative organisations or through the activities of parliamentarians within Parliament holding the government to account, there is that opportunity for concerns to be flagged and for any review to be undertaken. And I should add that it would not just be for government to have that particular um, opportunity, should it be required, but indeed Parliament at any time in any capacity, be it committees or otherwise, can choose to instigate a review of any particular piece of legislation. And indeed, it is something that is routine and good practice. So I would ask that in, in light of this, given the continued close engagement that takes place between government and business, and the fact that ministers and government are held to account from Parliament, which would provide an opportunity for questions and updates on how these pro provisions of this bill are operating in practice, that Ms Mockin would um, consent to not pressing her amendments. Um, as for the government amendments, convener, these are intended to respond to criticism of the effect of Section 13, which was made by stakeholders and practitioners in the field in relation to rights of compensation and other similar rights that the debtor may have against the assigner. Amendments 5, 6 and 7 respond to concerns of members of the Scottish Law Commission's advisory group on movable transactions, which related more to the impact of the provision on compensation, set-off, retention balancing of accounts or counterclaims rather than on defences. 
Amendments 5 and 6 remove wording which was considered might not exactly replicate the existing common law rule, whereby a debtor can, after the claim is assigned, assert a right of compensation, set off and so on, which the debtor had against the assigner against the assignee. These provisions are replaced by Amendment 7, which is intended to preserve the current position where notice of the assignation is intimated, but has the effect of ensuring that the registration of an assignation is not to be treated in the same way as intimation. Whereas giving notice of intimation of the assignation would have the effect that subsequent dealings between the assigner and the debtor would not be included in any calculation of compensation, etc., that the debtor could not assert against the assignee, registration is not to have that effect, unless accompanied by other actings which would be treated as notice to the debtor that the claim had been assigned. Yeah, thank you. So, any other colleagues have any questions? More points on it is? Okay, so with that, Carol Mocken to wind up or press or withdraw Amendment 47. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I do appreciate the Minister's comments in terms of um, how seriously they've taken this matter, so I'm not going to press 47. Okay, so Carol Mocken seeks to withdraw Amendment 47. Does any member object? Okay, thank you. So Amendment 47 is withdrawn. So, we call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 47. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to or well agreed? Agreed. So, <coughs> Amendment 5 is agreed. So, I call Amendment 48 in the name of Carol Mochen, already debated with Amendment 47. Carol Mochen to move or not move? Not moved. Okay. So I call so yeah, I call Amendment forty nine in the name of Carl Mocken, already debated with Amendment forty seven. Carl Mocken to move or not move? Not moved. So I call Amendment fifty in the name of Carl Mocken, already debated with Amendment forty seven. Carl Mocken to move or not move? Not moved. <coughs> so I call Amendment six in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment forty seven. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. And the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Amendment 6 is agreed. I call Amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 47. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <coughs> The questions at section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? I call Amendment 51 in the name of Carol Mochen. Already debated with Amendment 47. Carol Mochen to move or not move? Moved, please. Okay. So the question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. Uh, there will be a division. <clears throat> so all those who um, all those who agree, please raise your hands. All those against? So the, resu the result of the division is 3 for and 2 against. So Amendment 51 is agreed to. I call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 62. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Amendment 8 is agreed. The question is that Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yep. The question is that Sections 15 to 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 1. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 23 to 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. So we then move to fees. I call Amendment 64 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, grouped with Amendment 81. Jeremy Balfour to move Amendment 64 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, Kavina, this is really an amendment for uh, future proofing the uh, bill, which will hopefully become an act in regard to the fees for third sector organisations. Uh, there was um, a helpful evidence session 
um, that we held with a number of groups and also have received written evidence around this as well. Um, and that is in regard to if um, a third sector organisation um, is having to go to the register, then the fee would not have to be paid uh, by them for that service. Um, now, I know that the Minister helpfully wrote to the committee, I think um, either beginning of this week or the end of last week, to say that the government was not persuaded in regard to that. Um, and I would be interested to know a wee bit more about why the government has gone down this road. Now, I accept two things. I said, firstly, that we do want the register to be um, not a loss leader, if I can put it that way, but to break even. But we also need to protect some of the most vulnerable people in our society from having an expense that may stop them being able to go forward. And secondly, I do accept that the fee, um, as imagined by the government, which will come into force next year, is not um, a large fee, uh, comparatively, but we do not know where that fee will go in future. And there is opportunity for that fee to perhaps, again, stop people who are vulnerable in our society being able to get the access to the register that others who can financially afford it um, to be able to do that. Um, it is not my expectation uh, that this that people from third sector organisations will be using this on a frequent basis. But I do think where it is necessary for a third sector organisation to do it, then that fee should be waived. And so I uh, look forward to hearing what the Minister has to say in regard to these two particular amendments. Okay, thank you. Any other colleagues? Any points or questions? OK. Uh, Minister. Convener, I note that Amendments 64 and 81 in the name of Jeremy Balfour will exempt not-for-profit money advisers from the fee structure which will apply to searches of the assignation record and the statutory pledges record in cases where those advisers do not charge individuals for their services. I appreciate that this takes forward a recommendation to that effect in, commit in the committee's stage one report, although of course that was written at a time when the bill would have allowed individual consumers to grant a pledge. The committee will be aware that I have set out the Scottish Government's position in two separate letters to the committee, and I am happy to reiterate that position now. The Scottish Ministers are in consultation with the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, empowered by Section 110 of the Land Registration Scotland Act 2012, to set the level of fees which apply to cover the costs of maintaining and operating the registers under the Keeper's control. Any proposal to exempt any class or group of persons from the fee structure will mean that the costs will need to be found elsewhere, either by passing them on to other users of the registers one moment, please, which I think we can all agree would be unfair, or by those costs being met from the public purse. So that does need very careful consideration, given the current budget pressures we're facing. I'm happy to give way. Um, I thank the Minister for uh, giving way. I, I mean, I question whether we, we do think it is all fair. Um, you know, the argument I would put back in response to that is, you know, business and commercial users of this legislation are getting, you know, a serious benefit uh, from, from, from it passing, and you know, do, within that, uh, should should the fees they pay to access the register, you know, not not be, uh, you know, not not be used uh, to help uh, protect uh, the most disadvantaged uh, in our society. Well, I'm about to come on to a couple of practical points, uh, Mr Mundell, because you will be aware that I have brought forward amendments today to remove individuals from being able to grant a statutory pledge under Part 2 of the Bill. And if this change is made, it is unclear to me why not-for-profit and money advisors would be routinely searching the register of statutory pledges on behalf of their clients. As I indicated in my recent letter, there is also some doubt over whether searches of the register of assignations would be of much assistance to not-for-profit money advisors, as where debts have been assigned in a bulk assignation transaction, it is highly unlikely that the debtor's name will be on the register, and because the register can only be searched by reference to the assigner of the debt, not the debtor. In addition, the system has been designed so that the debtor is not expected to search the register. That is why the bill provides that a simple failure to search the register does not mean that the debtor is acting in bad faith if they make payment to the original creditor. 
It is also important to recognise that the fees which will apply for registration events and searches in the two new registers will be the subject of consultation before the fee structure is established in regulations under the Bill. That consultation is, in my view, the best vehicle for a proper examination of all the issues, and I am happy to reassure members of the committee that the consultation will explore the issue of fee exemptions. I therefore think it would be inappropriate to bring forward any part of the fee structure for the two new registers in advance of that consultation. So it is for these reasons that I would ask the member not to press these amendments. Okay. Thank you, Minister. So, Jeremy Balfour to wind up and also to press or withdraw Amendment 64. Thank you, Convener. Convener, I, I think I said in my opening remarks uh, around these two amendments, but I did not think this would be something that would happen on a frequent basis. Um, and the Minister said routinely, and I agree with him, I, I, I hope that if we get this legislation right, that it will be the exception rather than the rule which I think then leads to a slight contradiction in regard to his argument, saying that this is going to put such an extra cost on others to meet because they're going to be using it so often. I, I think this is a, um, a, something that will only be used irregularly, but it may well be required from time to time um, as the Bill and as the Act develops. And I do think it's actually quite an important message for Parliament to give and for Parliament to give the Scottish Government a steal on, well, more than a steal, to set out where we think we should end up. And that is, we don't think the third sector should be involved in having to pay this fee. Um, now, I, I, I accept the Minister says that there's going to be consultation around this uh, once the um, bill becomes a, an act. But I do still think, um, certainly from this committee, we are of a view um, in our report that this shouldn't happen for non-for-profit third sector organisations. And I think it's quite a clear message we want to give both to the public and to Scottish Government that this is not a road we want to go down. And for that reason, I'm, I seek to move Amendment 11 in my name. No. <coughs> Sorry, it's uh, 64. Oh, yeah, oh, apologies. Yes, my thoughts. Yes, right. no. OK. OK, so thank you. So the question is that Amendment 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay, well, there will be a division. So all those in favour of Amendment 64, please raise your hands. All those against? So the result of Division 64 is 3-4 and 2 against. So Amendment 64 is agreed. The question is that Section 31 be agreed. Now, are we all agreed? The question is that sections 32 and 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. So we move to the response to information request. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 31, 32, 33 and 34. Minister to move Amendment 10 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, Section 105 makes it clear that a person entered on the register as the secured creditor in respect of a statutory pledge should be obliged to respond to a request for certain information about that pledge. Subsection 1A sets out that the information to be provided in response to a request will vary depending on the facts. If the person is a secured creditor, they can be asked to specify first whether property specified in the request is encumbered property and second to describe the secured obligation. If the person registered as a creditor is no longer the secured creditor or has never been the secured creditor, they must provide information to that effect and, if relevant, details of the person to whom they assigned the pledge and any further known details of subsequent assignees. Section 105.1a2 provides that the secured creditor should also provide a description of the secured obligation. The committee has, however, received representations to the effect that it is not clear why a secured creditor should disclose the nature or extent of a secured obligation to anyone other than the provider of a pledge, who will have this information anyway. 
We understand that this disclosure requirement does not arise in relation to other types of security interest. It is therefore felt that there ought to be a limit to what information an entitled person should be permitted to obtain pursuant to section 105, given that they will obtain confirmation of whether or not the relevant property comprises encumbered property under section 105.1a1, which is what should be important. The deletion of section 105.1a2 will remove the requirement to provide details of the secured obligation. And Amendment 32 provides for this. Amendment 31 and 33 are consequential on this change. Amendments 10 and 34 deal with a different aspect of information requests. If an entitled person does not re receive a response to a request for information about a statutory pledge, they can apply to the court in respect of that failure under section 105.6. Amendment 34 simply permits a court to stipulate a period other than 14 days to require a secured creditor to respond to a request for information under a court order, although 14 days will remain the default period. Amendment 10 makes a similar change in relation to section 34, under which an entitled person may ask a person identified in the, in the assignation's record as the assignee for information about whether a claim has been assigned or whether a condition has been satisfied, and if the request is not complied with, the court may order a response. I move Amendment 10. Thank you, Minister. Any other colleagues? OK, the Minister to wind up. Nothing further to add, Convener. OK, thank you. So the questions at Amendment 10 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The questions is that Section 34 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We move to errors in search results. I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 35. Uh, the Minister to move Amendment 11 and speak to both amendments in the group. Convener, Amendment 11 amends Section 35 of the Bill so that failure of the Keeper's search system in relation to the assignations record in the Register of Assignations will be added to the list of scenarios where the Keeper will be liable to pay compensation for any loss suffered as a result of the failure to identify the assigner correctly. The issue applies equally to the Register of Statutory Pledges as to the Register of Assignations, and so Amendment 35 makes similar provision to Section 107 of the Bill for the Statutory Pledges record where a search fails to correctly disclose the the provider of a statutory pledge. To be clear, these amendments are not about wrong information being submitted by the applicant or entered into the register by the Register of Scotland. Rather, they cover the situation where the register itself is correct, but the search engine could malfunction and does not disclose the information sought correctly, in which case the keeper should be liable if the searcher suffers loss as a result of that failure. I move Amendment 11. Thank you. Uh, any members have any comments? OK, thank you. Minister to wind up. Nothing further to add, Convener. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Sections 36 and 37 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 1. The Minister move or not move? Moved. <coughs> the question is... That Amendment 12 be agreed to, or will agreed? Yes. And the question is that Section 38 be agreed to, or will agreed? Yes. So we move to the report on assignation. I call on Amendment 52 in the name of Carol Mochen in a group on its own. Carol Mochen to move and speak to Amendment 52. Thank you, Convener. I move Amendment 52. I do not wish to repeat myself as this amendment serves as a similar purpose to that of Amendment 51. Similarly, at the end of Section 38, I wish to make it incumbent upon Government to report on the assignation of consumer credit debts within three years, considering in particular the impact the removal of the need for intimation has had on debtors. Again, I consider it important that we monitor impacts and produce relevant reports to ensure we are constantly developing the bill and, and ensuring it is continuing to meet its intended needs. I move. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And any other members have any comments? No? Okay, thank you. Minister? Convener, as the committee is aware, the legislation makes it possible for intimation by means of registration of the assignation document in a new register of assignations. This is intended to address concerns about the current system being expensive and cumbersome due to the need to intimate to all debtors, as well as the inability to deal with future claims and future debtors. There is a misconception that currently in a bulk assignation of consumer debt, assignations are in 
intimated to debtors and that the legislation will remove the need to intimate to such debtors. In fact, the committee has heard evidence that due to the various workarounds, such as using English law put in place to effectively circumvent the difficulties with the current system, debtors are currently not being notified. This is not problematic because either that the parties are actually happy for the debtor to continue to pay the original person, or there's a protection for debtors who don't know to pay the new person in those cases where the payment right ought to have transferred across. It is therefore difficult to see how Amendment 52 would work in practice, as it is based on a misunderstanding that such intimation is currently routinely taking place. In particular, subsection 2 refers to the removal of the need to intimate to debtors, which, as I've just mentioned, ignores the fact that debtors are most commonly not being notified at present in a bulk assignation of consumer debt, because these are done via one of the various workarounds. I'm grateful for Mr. I, I, I mean, I accept what the Minister has said there, but isn't part of the reason for this piece of legislation is to encourage intimation now to take place on a more regular basis? And thus, I accept because people have been using the English law to work, make this work, that intimation hasn't been happening. But surely, if we now have this in place, intimation will be more common. Well, the provision is to introduce a new register of assignations, which is about simplifying the existing process. We have a, a de facto process at the moment where intimation is not taking place, which requires these complex workarounds. The introduction of the register of assignations will mean that these complex workarounds are no longer required. And as such, intimation will still be an option that will be available. But it is not, as suggested by the amendment, something that is, is, is being removed. It is not the reality at the moment that intimation routinely takes place when there is these workarounds already in place, so to speak. So I think the, the amendment reflects, in my view, um, a misunderstanding of what the reality of the, of the current situation is, which is that these workarounds are being used regularly. And as such, what the bill is seeking to do, amongst other things, is to ensure that rather than having to use these complex workarounds in Scotland, we will have access to the new register of assignations, which will help to simplify that process. Um, I would just want to add, um, that as I said in my letter to the committee earlier this month, when I met with a range of consumer and um, money advice representatives to discuss stage, stage two amendments, their view was that nothing more was needed in relation to consumers and assignation of debt. In the event that their view on this were to change in the future, we would of course engage with them at the time that, that happened. However, the prescriptive nature of a predetermined review would not lend itself well to that. So I hope this reassurance to the committee um, uh, aids in understanding that this amendment is not needed, and I would ask that it is not pressed. Okay, thank you, Minister. I carry on to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 52. Uh, thank you, Convener. I appreciate the Minister's remarks in this regard, and uh, given the discussion that uh, has happened, I will not press a 52 at this stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, Carol Walken seeks to withdraw Amendment 52. Does any member object? <coughs> okay. Amendment 52 is withdrawn. I call Amendment 65 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 1. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. Okay, thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Okay. So there will be a division. Now, all those in favour of Amendment 65, uh, please raise your hands. All those against? The result of division 65 is 3 4 and 2 against. So the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. The questions at section 39 be agreed to are well agreed. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move. OK. <clears throat> uh, the question is that Section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We move to pledge the technical amendments. I call Amendment 13 in the name of the Minister. Grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. So, Minister, to move Amendment 13 and speak to all the amendments in the group. 
Amendment 13 relates to Section 42 of the Bill, which reforms and codifies the law on delivery of property to a secured creditor for the purpose of creating a possessory pledge. In relation to the subsection 1c, it had been thought that it was necessary to provide that a person holding property on behalf of a creditor should be a fully independent third party. Representations were, however, made to the committee that, they miss not, that this may not always be possible or desirable. We understand that delivery of warehouse goods is sometimes affected for the purposes of creating a pledge by instructing the custodian to hold the goods for the pledge when the custodian is a sister company of the pledger, on the basis that the pledger does not control the custodian. Reference to such custodians as being independent of a pledge provider appears to eliminate this current option and may require increased custody costs to be incurred by the pledge provider. Amendment 13 therefore simply removes the requirement for the holder of the property to be fully independent. Amendment 21 makes a minor change to the position where a secured creditor wishes to purchase all or any of the property which is the subject of a pledge enforcement notice. This already has to happen by means of a public auction. However, instead of the price having to be one which bears a reasonable relationship to market value, it would now have to be that price or more. This would allow a secured creditor to purchase something at above market value if they wanted to, wanted to do so. Amendment 27 tweaks the effect of section 92.6 of the bill, which deals with whether an entry in the statutory pledges record will be considered to be seriously misleading in relation to the description of property which is encumbered by a statutory pledge. The amendment is technical and intended to remove any doubt that, if it is not quite clear whether property is of one type or another, it may be described as being two different types of property. At the moment, the registration would be ineffective if the view was taken that one of these descriptions was erroneous. The amendment will ensure that the registration would be effective so long as it was described as being of the type that it actually is. A search of either type would disclose the property. Amendment 29 relates to the procedures around correction of the Register of Statutory Pledges in a case where the registered creditor has failed to comply with a demand for correction from a person with an interest in the pledge. The amendment relates to the right of a secured creditor to object to a pro proposed correction under section 97.4. It may be that in some rare cases the party who is the registered secured creditor may not actually be the secured creditor due to an error or an off-register assignation. It would seem appropriate that the true secured creditor should be entitled to object to the proposed correction. The right to apply to the court to oppose the making of a correction is therefore broadened out by the amendment to the actual secured creditor as well as the registered secured creditor. The amendment also makes provision for the registered creditor to pass on the notice of the proposed correction, but subject, of course, to the registered creditor being able to do so. Amendments 39 and 41 respond to the committee's comments on the Delegated Powers Memorandum and its recommendation in its Stage 1 report that the Government amend the Bill at Stage 2 to make regulations under Section 538 subject to the affirmative resolution in all cases, so that there could be enhanced scrutiny of any proposals to specify the classes of motor vehicle that certain protections should not apply to. The committee recommended the power should be amended to be subject to affirmative procedure in all cases, and I am happy to comply with that request. Turning to Mr Balfour's amendments, I understand that Amendment 79 is intended to clarify that only prior ranking diligence can extinguish a pledge. However, the section amended by this amendment is not concerned with the ranking of such things. Section 76 is only concerned with when an application for correction must be made. The level of description that is used here will have no effect on the law of the interaction of pledges and diligence. Indeed, I am concerned that this amendment could have the opposite effect from that which is intended, because it could be read as implying that only a particular type of diligence is to result in a correction, but all diligence would extinguish the pledge. I would therefore ask Mr Balfour not to press this amendment, and if he has particular concerns about the general law in this area, then I am happy to put these concerns to the SLC's advisory group on his behalf. Amendment 83 would add in trustees and agents to the definition of secured creditor in the bill. However, that definition already includes any successor in title or representative of a secured creditor. There is also further provision made about representatives at section 116.2. As a result, we believe that this amendment is unnecessary and potentially confusing. I would ask Mr Balfour not to press it on the basis that the policy I believe these amendments are designed to achieve is already provided for. And I move Amendment 13.
Thank you, Minister. So I move to Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 79 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, can I thank the Minister for his uh, comments so far? Uh, he is right. Uh, the uh, Amendment 79 does seek to clarify that only the execution of prior ranking diligence will extinguish a statutory pledge. Um, but in the light of his comments that he had made uh, earlier, uh, I will not be moving this. I will go away and seek to reflect on it in regard to stage three. Um, in regard to um, Amendment 83, uh, this goes back to a previous uh, debate we had earlier um, this morning, um, because, again, this amendment is to extend the interpretation of a secured creditor. Now, I note the, the Minister believes that this is already in the bill, and I accept this, but I do still think this gives greater clarity, and perhaps I can just explain briefly why. Um, the bill does not include a trust deal agent with an interpretation of a secured creditor, and this amendment provides a fuller definition of the parties defined as secured creditor. In corporate finance transactions, it is likely that a club or syndicate of lenders jointly lend to a corporate debtor. Here, one will take security in their own name as security agent or security trustee to hold the security for the benefit of all lenders. Thus, we could have, for example, HSBC, Bank of Scotland, Royal Bank of Scotland, jointly agreeing to advance a loan to an ABC Limited in various proportions of one of them, say, the Bank of Scotland, holding all security granted in respect of the aggregate amount of the loan owned to all lenders. Whilst Bank of Scotland would be the benefit of the security, it would be misleading to think of them as the sole beneficiary of the security as they are holding the security as trustee or agent for all other lenders. I think this will bring a bit of clarity. Again, in practical terms, it will be helpful, I think, for business, and I will seek to move that in due course. OK, uh, thank you. Any other members have any comments? OK, thank you. So, Minister, to wind up. Nothing further to add. Okay, no. Thank you. So the questions that Amendment 13 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The questions that Section 42 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. We move to pledge individuals. So I call Amendment 14 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and the Minister to move Amendment 14 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. My amendments in this group give effect to the undertaking given by the Scottish Government to remove the ability of individual consumers to grant a statutory pledge. Amendment 17 removes section 48 from the Bill. The provision which allowed the provider of a statutory pledge to be an individual as long as the pledge met certain criteria. Amendment 16 is the most important amendment in the group. It provides that it will not be competent for individuals to grant a statutory pledge unless the individual falls within a specified exception. The primary exception is where the individual is acting in the course of their own business and the encumbered property is a permitted asset which will be used wholly or mainly for the purposes of the individual's business. The amendment will also permit individuals to grant a pledge if they are acting as a trustee of a charity or they are acting as a member of an unincorporated association. In such cases, a permitted asset would have to be an asset of the charity or owned on behalf of the unincorporated organisation. Yeah. Um, can I first of all thank the Minister for these amendments? I think they are really helpful and I think do get us to where the committee once you get to, I am really looking for clarification. Clearly, there is a balance between an individual and a sole trader, and it's getting that balance right. Th there isn't any. We started with the bill at the moment, saying if it was a thousand pounds, is there any advantage looking at stage three to absolutely clarify the situation to have that figure increase to say five thousand pounds or ten thousand pounds? Would that give absolute clarity to individuals, or would that not bring any benefit towards the individual? I'm, I'm generally I'm seeking clarification so that we keep a balance between sole traders and individuals on this point. 
Yes, I, I'm going to come to that further on in my remarks, but what we are proposing through amendments is to increase that to £3,000, and there would be regulation-making powers allowing for that figure to be increased subsequently in the future. Just to pick up on where I was uh, prior to taking intervention with regards to charities and unincorporated organisations, we think it is important that uh, bodies such as charities and unincorporated organisations, such as sporting clubs, should be able to raise finance on the strength of their own assets. And I just wanted to make sure that was on the record. For a corporeal asset to be pledged by a relevant individual, that asset will also need to be worth a certain amount. This is a rule that previously applied only to individual consumers, but it will now be a rule for sole traders and the other narrow categories of individual who are to be allowed to grant a statutory pledge. This provides added protection on top of the rule that assets need to be of a certain type of asset, essentially a business asset. The Government has also accepted the Committee's uh, recommendation that this threshold should be raised to £3,000. It can also be raised in future by regulations to confirm. This, coupled with the rule about, rule about, how, as about how the asset is owned or used, effectively means household goods cannot be pledged. We have, however, as we did previously with consumers, taken a power to specify particular assets which cannot be pledged. While we do not expect to need to use this, it would allow us to plug any gaps where they to arise. The committee recommended in its stage one report that the government should consider creating more protections in the bill for sole traders, since they will in many cases be in a similar position to individual consumers. I consulted with the Federation of Small Businesses on this point, and their, and their view is that no specific protections were required for sole traders who should be treated as adults in the business world. The Government has, however, brought forward Amendment 20, which provides that a court order will now be required if a pledge is to be enforced against a sole trader. The FSB have indicated that they think that this is a useful protection. Sole traders are, of course, also protected by Amendment 16 in that they are not allowed to pledge assets which are unrelated to their business or which fall beneath the £3,000 threshold, so they will not be able to pledge essential items in their home. Amendments 14, 15, 18, 19, 22 and 38 are consequential amendments which reflect the removal of Section 48 and the removal of the ability of individual consumers to grant a statutory pledge. Amendment 37 adds the new regulation-making power added by Amendment 16 to the list of delegated powers which will be subject to the affirmative procedure. I now turn to Carol Mawkins' amendments. Amendment 16A would have the effect that permitted assets exclude household goods that are essential for heating, cooking or laundry purposes, so that it would not be possible to use such items as collateral for a loan under a statutory pledge. This will, of course, only apply to those such as sole traders who are able to grant a statutory pledge under Amendment 16 and not the general population. It is our view that the monetary threshold of £3,000 now proposed would cover all goods which are used for heating, cooking or laundry purposes within a home, and it is therefore unnecessary to make special provision for these. It also seems very unlikely that any prospective creditor would lend on the basis of such collateral, or that assets which are used for these purposes within a home would meet the business purposes element of the permitted assets test. The tests that are already applied are designed precisely to exclude ordinary household goods. However, adding, forward to on, adding a further rule on this may result in complexity and unintended consequences. For example, this might prevent a sole trader who provides cooker installations from granting a pledge over their business stock. We have the power to carve out further things from the, de the definition of permitted assets if we were to need to do so in the future. But we do not want to overcomplicate matters unnecessarily and potentially create a situation where unintended consequences could arise. In relation to Amendment 16b, I appreciate that it may seem a good idea to provide that the monetary limit for the value of property to be pledged be subject to annual update in line with the Retail Prices Index. But we think that this is unnecessary. Inflation in the past few years prior to the recent surge has been relatively low, and the current figure is expected to fall. The threshold is already being increased to £3,000. We believe this is ample in terms of excluding household white goods and similar, but there is a power allowing the threshold to be increased further as and when it is appropriate. 
However, it is worth bearing in mind that this figure is also not the only means of ensuring that ordinary household items are not pledged. A sole trader would have to be acting in the course of their business, and the asset would have to be one that was used wholly or mainly for the business purpose. The threshold is therefore less critical than it was when it was applicable to and only to ordinary consumers. Amendment 16b does not actually provide for the threshold to be changed on the face of the Act, which we believe would lead to significant fusion. However, to amend the figure in the Act would mean the regulations would have to be brought before Parliament annually. Since any rise is likely to be of a negligible order, we do not believe that this is the best use of parliamentary time on an annual basis. We think that it would be more efficient to simply update the figure every few years, taking into account the level of inflation prevalent at the time. Depending on that rate of inflation, the figure in the Act may have to be amended more often if inflation is higher, but less often if it is lower, and therefore a set period for amendments does not seem appropriate. So for all of these reasons, I would ask Carol Mochen not to press her amendments, and I move Amendment 14. Thank you, Minister. So, Carol Mochen to speak to Amendment 16a and the other amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. And uh, as you say, I speak to my amendments in this group. The Minister has spoken to his, his Amendment 16, um, and I'm really pleased uh, with uh, his points on this matter about it being one of the most important amendments um, and that he clearly listened to the committee on this point. And I'm content with the points he made with regards to Amendment 16a. Um, around household goods, that are goods that I explicitly am keen to make sure people would not lose around heating, cooking and laundry purposes. However, I would be great for just in, in reply for further reassurance that you might be able to produce some guidance notes or, or you know, points so that this legislation makes it clear. Um, but I do, I do appreciate the, that the Minister uh, has that, this on the record, so it might not be necessary. In relation to Amendment 16b, this amendment is pretty self-explanatory, as you have said, but it is very much as per the committee report recommendations, and it is important that the figure provided in subsection 2b of the Minister's Amendment 16 is automatically updated annually um, on an agreed date by reference to the Retail Price Index, and that was in the committee's report. The amendment seeks to ensure such a seeks to ensure such assurances are written explicitly into the Bill. There would be an expectation that the ability to increase this figure would remain within the delegated powers of the Scottish Government, should it be necessary. But again, a convener, my amendment here is a procedural and an attempt to ensure that we are clear that the RPI must be referred to annually in relation to the figure. I do appreciate that the Minister may consider an annual review to be overkill, but I do believe it would be hel a helpful step and would provide Parliament with the reassurance that we are regularly reviewing this le really, uh, legislation in relation to the RPI. OK, uh, thank you. Do any other members have any comments? No. OK, thank you. So the Minister to wind up. Thank you, Convener. I would just like to conclude in by this section by saying and reiterating my sincere thanks to the committee for their input on um, this particular issue and also to um, put on the record my um, sincere thanks to those money advice organisations and those within the small business community who have engaged in this because clearly the key challenge has been to get the balance right and I believe with the suite of amendments that the government has brought forward we have achieved that balance while protecting individual consumers but not denying small businesses and sole traders the opportunity to utilise the provisions within this legislation which I know will be warmly welcomed. I, I recognise the well-intentioned nature um, of Carol Mochen's um, amendments. However, I, I do not think they are required. I think with regards to the risk around household goods, as has been touched on, the existing provisions within the amendments effectively means that they would not fall under um, the category of goods that could be used as a collateral for a statutory pledge, owing to the fact that they are household goods, not normally used, not predominantly used for business, and would indeed likely fall under the £3,000 monetary threshold. With regards to the second amendment, uh, pertaining to an annual increase on the monetary threshold. Again, I, I recognise the intent there, but I think it would be a better approach would be to have greater flexibility, recognising as well as, as the way in which the amendment is drafted
granted would mean that there would be no change on the face of the bill, which would necessitate complex calculations unless ministers were to bring forward annual updates, which, as I outlined in my earlier remarks, could be negligible, particularly as we look towards moving to a period of lower inflation. So on that basis, I would um, ask that um, Carol Mockin not move her amendments and the committees to support my amendments. OK, thank you. So with that, the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to and well agreed. I call Amendment 15 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to or well agreed. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 54. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. Okay. The question is that Amendment 67 be agreed to or well agreed. Yeah. And the question is that Section 43 be agreed to or well agreed. Yes. I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 14, the Minister to move or not move. Moved. Yeah. I call Amendment 16A in the name of Carol Mochen, already debated with Amendment 14. Carol Mochen to move or not move? Not move. <coughs> I call Amendment 16B in the name of Carol Mochen, already debated with Amendment 14. Carol Mochen to move or not move? Move. move. The question is that Amendment 16B be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay, there will be a division. <coughs> All those in favour of Amendment 16B, please raise your hands. All those against? Okay. The result of Division 16B is 3 for and 2 against, so the amendment is agreed. So the Minister to Press overdraw Amendment 16 as amended. I press. press. So the question is that Amendment 16, as amended, uh, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I call Amendment 68 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move, Commissioner. The question is that Amendment... Oh, sorry, uh, the question is that section set 44 be agreed to, are we all agreed? The question is that sections 45 and 46 be agreed to, are we all agreed? I call Amendment 69, in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, no move. Sorry, was that not move? Not, not there, sorry. I call Amendment 70 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 58. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Commissioner. Okay. The question is Amendment 70 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Mm. Okay. Uh, there will be a division. Uh, all those in favour of Amendment 70, uh, please raise your hands. All those against? The result of the division is 3 for and 2 against, so the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 71 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 58. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, moved. And the question is Amendment 71 be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. Yes. No, there will be a division. All those in favour of Amendment 71, please raise your hands. All those against? So <clears throat> um, the result of Division 71 is 3 for and 2 against. So the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 72 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 58. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, Convener. The question is that Amendment 72 be agreed to or well agreed? No, OK. Uh, there will be a division. Um, all those in favour of Amendment uh, 72, please raise your hands. 
All those against? <coughs> so the result of Division 72 is 3 4 and 2 against, so Amendment 72 is agreed. Uh, the question is that uh, Section 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Yes. Uh, call Amendment 17 in name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 49 to 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 73 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not to move? Uh, not to move. And the question is that sections 54 and 55 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 74 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 54. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, can we know? Yeah. The question is that Amendment 74 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 75 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move. The question is that sections 58 to 63 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 20, in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? I'm moved. The question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 64 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 65 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 76 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, so, I didn't catch the number. Sorry. Come oh, sorry. Uh, 76. 76 is... Oh, my apologies, I just lost my piece of paper. Where was that called with him? Come here. Yeah, so it's a oh, I'm mean, sorry, yeah, not moved. Sorry, I would like my bit of paper. No bother. Yeah. <clears throat> so I call Amendment 21 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 13. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. So the question is that Amendment 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that sections 67 to 69 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 77 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Okay. The question is that section 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 14. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 22 be agreed to or well agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 78 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. The question is that Section 71 be agreed to or well agreed? The question is that sections 72 to 75 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 79 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 13. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. The question is that section 76 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 80 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. 
Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. The question is that sections 77 to 90 may be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Yes. Okay. And with that, I will take a, a five minute comfort break. I will suspend for five minutes.
Yeah. And welcome back. And so we move to the pledge uh, supervening inaccuracies. So I'll call Amendment 23 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And the Minister to move Amendment 23 and speak to all amendments in the group. Convener, this is a very technical group of amendments relating to section 91 of the Bill. There are a number of other sections in the Bill which protect good faith purchasers more generally, but this section is concerned specifically with people who rely on the register, but the register is wrong. The section provides that a person who acquires encumbered property for value in good faith and exercising reasonable care will acquire that property free from the pledge in certain circumstances. Those circumstances are where the person searches the register, but the entry in the statutory pledge is recorded at the time of acquisition, has not come to include either an inaccuracy in the entry that is seriously misleading or an inaccuracy by reason of the removal of an entry from the record. Amendment 23 can be taken in two parts, but the changes both relate to encumbered property that has an identifying number, for example, a vehicle identification number. First, the effect of Amendment 23 is that, in relation to an entry where the property has an identifying number, the purchaser will only receive the property free from the pledge in the circumstances I have just mentioned, if that identifying number is wrong or absent, and it was a requirement under the Register's rules to include that number. So, if there was no such requirement, but the person registering the statutory pledge included the number voluntarily, the property would be immune from the reach of Section 91. This reflects the fact that people should not be penalised for including additional information, and brings the section into line with the rules that apply under Section 92 at the time the pledge is created. Secondly, it is possible that an identifying number which is correctly included at the time of registration could later be removed by some malfunction or mistake. The entire entry could also be removed in error, meaning that the fact that the entry previously had a readily, readily searchable identifying number will be of no help. Even though this would appear likely to be a very rare occurrence, it could have significant consequences for those involved. Amendment 23 therefore provides that, in such circumstances, the good faith buyer will be protected and will acquire the property free from the pledge. Amendment 30 adjusts the rules about what register search facilities must be provided to take account of the fact that, in light of Amendment 23, there will now be no significance to an identifying number for property being wrong in cases where that information was not mandatory. Amendments 24, 25, 26 and 28 are consequential to Amendment 23 and simply update cross-references. I move Amendment 23. Okay, thank you. <coughs> so the question is that amendment. Pardon? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Do any members have any uh, questions? No. Okay. Yeah. So ask the minister to wind up. Nothing further to add, convener. Okay. So the question is that amendment twenty-three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 24, name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 23. The Minister to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Call Amendment 25, in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 23. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 91 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 23. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 13. Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 23. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 92 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Sections 93 to 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
I call Amendment 29 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 13. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 97 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections 98 to 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? I call Amendment 30 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 23. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. I call Amendment 81 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 64. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just see clarity? I wouldn't, didn't quite hear that one. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah. it's uh, Amendment 81. Oh, yeah, it moved, Convener. Moved, OK. The question is, Amendment 81, be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. OK. Yes. Uh, uh, OK, there will be a division. All those in favour of Amendment 81, please raise your hands. All those against? The result of Division 81 is 3-4 and two against, so the amendment is agreed. The question is that section 102 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that sections 103 and 104 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yep. So, I call amendments 31, 32, 33 and 34, all in the name of the Minister, and all previously debated with amendment 10. I invite the Minister to move Amendments 31 to 34 on block. Move and does any, does any member object? Yeah, me Sorry. <coughs> okay, Minister. Moved on block. Yeah. Does any member object to a single question we put on mm. Amendments 31 to 34? No. Okay. <coughs> so uh, the question is Amendments 31 to 34 are agreed. Uh, are agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 35 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 11. The Minister to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections 108 to 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 82 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not moved. Uh, <clears throat> I call Amendment 83 in the name of Jeremy Balfour. Already debated with Amendment 13. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, move, convener, please. The question is that Amendment 83 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. There will be a division. All those in favour of Amendment 83, please raise your hands. All those against? The result of Division 83 is 3, 4 and 2 against. So the amendment is agreed. The question is that Section 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. We move to electronic documents. I call Amendment 36 in the name of the Minister and grouped with amendments as shown in the grouping. So, Minister, to move Amendment 36 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Convener, this group of amendments is about electronic signatures. It responds to the committee's recommendation that the bill be amended to require only simple electronic signatures since advanced electronic signatures or qualified electronic signatures can create barriers to conducting business for most users. The matter was originally raised by Jeremy Balfour um, during Stage 1 evidence, and I am grateful to him for raising the issue. Section 116 of the Bill currently defines authenticated by reference to Section 9b2 of the Requirements of Writing Scotland Act 1995. Section 9b2 provides that an electronic document is authenticated if the electronic signature of the person who is authenticating it is incorporated into or logically associated with the electronic document 
was created by the person by whom it purports to have been created, and is of such type and satisfies such requirements, if any, as may be prescribed in, by the Scottish Ministers by regulations. Regulation 2 of the Electronic Documents Scotland Regulations 2014 requires the signature to be an advanced electronic signature. Section 9G1D of the 1995 Act further provides that it is not competent to record or register an electronic document in any register under the management and control of the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland unless section 9G2 and 3 both apply to the document. This means that the document must be presumed under section 9C or 9D or by virtue of section 9E to have been authenticated by the grantor and the document, electronic signature and any certification must be in such form and of such type as are prescribed by the Scottish Ministers in regulations. Regulation 3 of the 2014 regulations provides that for a document to be presumed authenticated under section 9C, the signature must be an advanced electronic signature and certified by a qualified certificate, certificate for signature. This means that both assignation documents under Part 1 of the Bill and constitutive documents for statutory pledges under Part 2 must be signed using an advanced electronic signature, and for it to be registered, it must also be certified by a qualified certificate. The Government has consulted stakeholders about this issue, including the Federation of Small Businesses and the Registers of Scotland. The FSB indicated that they thought that the forms of authentication beyond simple electronic signature were costly to small businesses. It is understood that the jump in cost and complexity between each level of signature is likely to be significant. I therefore believe that, in order to encourage the use of the new registers and to avoid unnecessary costs with smaller staff up businesses in mind, simple electronic signatures would offer the best option. Amendment 45 is the critical amendment in this grouping, as it removes the requirement for electronic signatures to be authenticated using advanced or qualified electronic signature. It will therefore be possible to use a simple electronic signature. It will, however, still be possible to use advanced or qualified electronic signatures if parties wish. The current definitions of authenticated and executed are removed from the Bill by Amendments 42 and 44. While well, Amendment 45 replaces the definition of authenticated with rules for the authentication of a document, it retains the substantive definition of execution of a document. The new subsection 1b in Amendment 45 allows ministers to modify subsection 1a, a and b in place of subsection 3, which is omitted by Amendment 46. Amendment 40 amends section 114 to replace the reference to section 116.3 with one to section 116b. This ensures that regulations under section 116.1b will be subject to the affirmative procedure. Amendment 43 consequentially defines electronic signature in section 116.1 for the purposes of the Bill because the definition in section 12.1 of the 1995 Act is no longer imported into the meaning of authenticated as a cross-reference to section 9b2 of the 1995 Act is removed by Amendment 42. Section 9G1D of the 1995 Act stipulates that it is not competent to record or register a document in any register under the management and control of the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland unless it includes a qualified electronic signature. Amendment 36 makes it clear that Section 9G1D will not apply to the registration of documents under the Bill, and so a simple electronic signature will suffice for authentication. Though there is nothing to stop parties using advanced electronic signatures or qualified electronic signatures, if required. And I move Amendment 36. Thank you, Minister. Do members have any comments? Okay. So the Minister's to wind up. <clears throat> nothing further to add, Convener. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 36 be agreed to or well agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 113 be agreed to or well agreed? Agreed. I call Amendment 84 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 55. Jeremy Balfour to move or not move? Uh, not move, Commissioner. <clears throat> we move to the review, the review of Act. Uh, I call Amendment 53 in the name of Carol Mochen, uh, grouped with Amendment 85. Carol Mochen to move Amendment 53 and speak to both amendments in the group. Th thank you, Convener. Um, 
I move Amendment 53. Um, this is a very similar amendment as I've gone through the document, to, similar to 51 and 52, in terms of the review, but in this case, of course, the wider legislation and implementation of the bill. Part of my amendment in this circumstance looks to provide further protection to sole traders and small businesses, making it incumbent upon government to consider the operation of provision related to statutory pledge on sole traders and small businesses. I believe it is important that we do this as soon as is practical upon the review period, which for the purposes of this would end three years to the day after royal assent. Indeed, such a review and report would be laid before Parliament to ensure MSPs are able to hold government to account on the implementation of this legislation. I hope the Minister, obviously we've had discussions, can see this amendment for how it is intended, which is to ensure Parliament is able to effectively scrutinise and hold to account based on the findings of a three-year review. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, thank you, Carol. And Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 85 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, can I just say, uh, can I thank the Minister for his previous amendments around electronic documents? I think that's really helpful for me when I do welcome them completely. Um, my uh, Amendment 85 is almost identical uh, to Amendment 53, um, which has already been moved. Um, I have nothing further to add, and if Amendment 53 is accepted, then I will be moving Amendment 85. Okay, thank you. Do any members have any comments? Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister? Uh, convener, Amendment 53 in the name of Carol Malkin and Amendment 85 in the name of Jeremy Balfour are, as Mr Balfour has acknowledged, almost identical in terms and will place a requirement on Scottish Ministers to undertake a review of the Act and report on that review after the end of the review period, three years after the legislation receives royal assent. In addition, Amendment 53 requires that the, re the review places a particular emphasis on the impact of the statutory pledge provisions on sole traders and small businesses. I appreciate that these are based on a recommendation contained in the Committee's Stage 1 report, though they have been modified slightly from the report proposal in order to reflect the removal of individual consumers from the statutory pledge provisions. I responded to the Committee in writing back in December about this recommendation, and it may be helpful if I restate my concerns about including such a requirement in the Bill. As I have referred to earlier in, in relation to other amendments, there is nothing to stop either the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament from carrying out a review of any aspect of a piece of legislation at any time. And this is, of course, a good thing. Undertaking such reviews as and when the need for them becomes apparent is, in my view, a more flexible and responsive approach. Yes, certainly. I am grateful to the Minister for, for giving way. Um, again, my question would be this piece of legislation has been kicking around for a number of years. It took a long time to get to the Parliament, a long time for the Government and Parliament to give it the priority uh, that those in, in, in the legal and business community felt it deserved. Um, does it not therefore seem unlikely uh, that if there are small issues uh, or, or tweaks that need to be made to this legislation, uh, that the Parliament is going to find time uh, to look at that without a clause like this being in place? I, I I appreciate the, the, the comments that uh, Mr Mundell makes, but my view is that, well, th there is nothing within legislation that precludes the possibility of a review. My concern is primarily around having it to a fixed timescale, for example, three years from royal assent. The registers will not come online at the earliest until next summer, so that is already a year <laughs> lost. So we're actually not looking at a three-year period of the Act being in operation but a two-year period of the Act being in operation. So I think it's important that there's flexibility there. I do recognise Parliament's interest in this and why it wants to nail something down in statute to ensure that a review, a, a review takes place. But I think it's incumbent upon Government and indeed Parliament more widely to keep all legislation under review and to respond to issues as and when they arise. I take the view that a more flexible approach will allow us to respond at a more opportune time and as such not find ourselves in a situation where we could be undertaking a review prematurely. Um, and in my just to go on with my what I was intending to say in my response yes, certainly. Um, if if uh, this clause was, was tweaked or uh, this amendment was tweaked um, at stage three to, to give an option to, to delay the review by a further year or two years? Is, would that make it more flexible and uh, more in line with the, the Minister's thinking? 
Well, I'm, I'm not going to give any commitments on that right here, other than to say I'd be more than happy to engage with any members to discuss that ahead of stage three. Um, I want to consider the proposals in the round and exactly what was being proposed. But um, if there is an op opportunity for compromise to recognise the need for flexibility, then I, of course, am happy to have that discussion. And I would hope the uh, committee would appreciate that as the approach of flexibility and pragmatism I have sought to demonstrate throughout um, the work that we have undertaken on this legislation. So if that is something that members of the committee would wish to discuss, or indeed any members in Parliament ahead of stage three, my, my door is always open and I would very much value the opportunity to have that discussion. I would want to say, though, that in, in my response to the committee uh, previously, I, I provided the following example. If this legislation had been enforced earlier and had included such a review provision, the disruption to businesses caused by the coronavirus pandemic would likely have rendered any review premature, because any relevant business activities would have been quite different from normal for a, a substantial amount of the period under review, but it would nonetheless have been necessary for the review to proceed. And conversely, if we felt that it was appropriate to carry out a review of the legislation sooner and wanted to do so after two and a half years, these amendments would still cause us difficulties because it would require us to carry out yet another review just six months later. The amendments provide that the review cannot be undertaken until after the end of the review period. And these are just some of the difficulties with trying to second guess in advance when will be the most appropriate time to review legislation. Um, but I would want to assure the committee that we will still want to work closely with organisations such as the Federation of Small Businesses to gauge how this legislation is helping them or possibly hindering them, and we will learn from that engagement. It is my view that this would be a more dynamic, responsive and proportionate approach as opposed to the more prescriptive method provided for by this amendment. Um, committee members will be aware too that the legislation contains a range of ministerial powers which will enable us, with the Parliament's approval, to modify the legislation in the light of that engagement. So for these reasons and, and for my openness to engage in, in, in further dialogue ahead of stage three around a perhaps a more flexible approach, um, I would ask that the respective amendments are not pressed. Okay, thank you, Minister. And Carol Morkin to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 53. Thank you, convener. I absolutely take note of the minister's, um, you know, position of engaging, and I don't doubt it for one minute. Um, I do think that scrutiny within the parliament is something that we do need to push, and so therefore, at this stage, I would press a uh, 53. Okay, thank you. So, the question is that Amendment 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, no, there will be a division. All those in favour of Amendment 53, please raise your hands. All those against? Okay, so Amendment 53, uh, the result is 3-4 and 2 against. So the amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 85 in the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 53. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, not move, Commissioner. Okay. <coughs> So I call amendments 37, 38, 39, 40 and 41, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 37 to 41 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 37 to 41? <coughs> so the question is that amendments 37 to 41 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Question is that section 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments 42, 43, 44, 45 and 46, all in the name of the Minister and previously debated with amendment 36. I invite the Minister to move amendments 42 to 46 on block. Moved on block. Does any member object to a single question being put to amendments 42 to 46? No. The question is that amendments 42 to 46 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The question is that section 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Mm -hmm. The question is that sections 117 and 118 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Okay, and that ends stage two consideration of the bill. <coughs> So, I uh, thank the Minister uh, and his officials for their attendance to the committee this morning. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that also concludes our meeting today. So, thank you. And the next meeting of the committee will take place on Tuesday, the 28th of March. So, with that, I'll close the meeting. Thanks. <coughs>